Okay, uh, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the 12-game main slate we have here on uh, Tuesday, July 25. Um, projections loaded to the site, etc. as usual. Um, interesting tournament slate once again. Big slate. Kind of spread out here, pitching-wise. Um, projections are you know, naturally kind of gravitating toward... A couple of guys in some pretty good spots. Um, Pablo Lopez, Blake Snell getting Seattle and Pittsburgh respectively up here, garnering a lot, most of the ownership, but certainly at the top guys. You have Corbin Burns who gets Cincinnati in uh, his fourth appearance against them this season, um, also seeing a lot of ownership. However, Corbin Burns, um, you know, well, we'll talk about that when you get to the game. Alex Cobb gets Oakland tonight, seeing some down here. Savali gets Kansas City. He tore them apart in his last appearance against them. Um, naturally popping, uh, of course. Guys here in the mid-range, got some couple of attackable spots, maybe like a Domingo Herman, George Kirby, Verlander type, something like that. Um, and then, you know, in Andrew Abbott, also seeing, you know, on the other side of that uh, Milwaukee game, also seeing them for the fourth time this season. Down here in the lower range, obviously not going to get excited about too many guys. Naturally, Kopech, uh, no thank you. Um, Hendricks, not a lot of upside from him. You know, Steven Matz uh, gives up pop to the right side. He gets Arizona. Gomber gets Washington, um, et cetera, et cetera, on down the list. So not too excited about red numbers down here naturally. Um, really, the only thing we got to keep an eye out for today, as usual, is just to flesh out some of these standard deviations uh, where we've got some uh, some noise coming through the models just yet. Um, we got some, you know, fishy numbers coming in, to say the least, across the industry. Uh, so we'll wait and push updates all throughout the day to get that fleshed out as, um, as we can. So let's uh, just get into the games here. Big 12 Gamer, let's try and breeze through this and... Um, and get after it. Justin Verlander on the mound for the Mets in New York in the Subway Series here. Um, taking on the Yanks. 9,100 for Verlander. I think this is fine. Um, I like the ownership here at, uh, you know, sub-15% so far. What I am really worried about with Verlander, as I really have, have been all season, is the 54% strike one. Um, he's still having trouble, you know, four of his last six starts, he's failed to crack 47% strike one. Um, and if you're not getting ahead of hitters, I don't care who you are. If I don't care what kind of value you're able to get on any one individual pitch, that's going to elevate your price tag because you're still getting value on your pitches, but it elevates the price tag at DFS and it makes it hard for me to play because you elevate the pitch count too, right? When you can't get ahead of hitters, uh, I'll leave it up to you guys to um, do a little bit of research and see what the difference is between a 1-0 and, and an 0-1 count in terms of offensive production. That said, we still like Verlander. He's starting to round into form, get quite a bit more comfortable here. He was really struggling earlier in the season. He's flattening out and um, you know really stabilizing a little bit. Curveball value starting to tick back northward, right? This is pretty bad for a little while. Uh, and everything else, pretty good. You know, four-seamer is okay, starting to eke out a little bit more value as we get more starts under his belt. Uh, but this is still the big problem. It's just the strike one. So at 9,100, that's what would take me off. Uh, we need him to go deeper into the game. Now, this is the Yankees, and they are a garbage, garbage offense. It, without Aaron Judge... It, he's very similar to Jordan Alvarez in that respect, right? And that he changes the entire complexion of the lineup. And it's not just because Judge is good, right? And you have to worry about how you pitch to him. It's how you have to pitch to everybody else around him. Because you can't, like, you're, if you have to choose, right? You're not going to let Aaron Judge beat you if you can help it. So that really forces you to have to go after everybody else. Right? And when they surround him with high-contact hitters, like a DJ LeMahieu, Glaber Torres types, Yankees over here, they get better pitches to hit. right? And that means opposing pitching staffs have to go after guys. They have to be aggressive. In the strike zone, they can't 
pick and choose who they want to go after. And without Judge in the lineup, they can do that. And, well, Judge is still out. So Verlander, I think, can still pick through this lineup. Earlier in the season, he did see them, went six innings, had one of his better outings um, when he was kind of volleying up and down. This was uh, just over a month ago, early part of June. He went six innings, struck out six, only gave up one run, sprayed just three hits. Fine performance from Verlander. I think that can be serviceable once again. We do have to keep in mind he is you know, a, a fly ball hitter. This is in Yankee Stadium. Um, but for the most part, I think he's going to be able to survive pretty well here. This team, the Yankees over here, since Judge went down in the early part of June, uh, they're one of the four worst teams in baseball in terms of run creation, batting average, on base, etc., etc., uh, power, they're still hitting for a little bit, but it's certainly ticked down since Judge has been gone. Um, this is a very attackable lineup, and this 93 WRC Plus is actually five, six ticks higher than it has been in the last two months. So um, all of these numbers are, are far depressed. They're not walking, right? Even Anthony Rizzo with a historically you know, 13, 15% walk rate, he's not walking at all this season, right? He's striking out a lot, not getting on base. Um, and and not walking, right? So really the only super dangerous hitter in this lineup over here is Glaber Torres. I did mention that DJ, of course, is you know still a contact hitter. He's seeing it a little bit better recently. Stanton perhaps rounding into form. But, um, you know, that's, that's really it. Everybody else is very much attackable. They did just activate Jake Bowers, probably have him leading off. He's 2,700. If you want to take shots, uh, okay, fine. Um with some short stacks of the Yankees, go after Verlander. It's okay. I'd probably just side with him, though. Domingo Herman is going for the Yankees. 8300 I think this price tag is a little fishy. Um, I just want him cheaper. I don't think he's a, an $8,500 arm uh, in, in general. Now, I do like the changeup. I do like the curveball. He's got good value on these two, right? But he's got a horrible, horrible four-seamer. And he is very similar to, uh, like, a John Gray in this respect. Right? A lot of guys have good breaking stuff, but a bad fastball. John Gray, well, I'll leave it up to you guys as well to dig into his outing last night. I know he gave up six runs, but it wasn't on the slider, which is his best pitch. It was on a bad fastball. Um, Domingo Herman has always had a bad fastball, and he's always had a pretty respectable curveball. This season, it's really taken a leap forward. Same thing with the changeup. So that's how he could survive here against the Mets. I think he's okay. And I think he's in play at 8,300. Um, but the Mets are a pretty good fastball hitting team. And, you know, they're going to hit the change okay. They're probably going to struggle a little bit with the curveball. But, uh, you know, for the most part, he's in play because he does have upside, right? He's got a two-tick above average raw strikeout rate of 25%. He's got good strike one. We don't have that worry right, that we've got with Verlander over here. He's got elite chase with this curveball change down in the strike zone. Now, he is also a fly ball hitter, but does give up some power. Not so much in the batting average. Kind of homer hunting when we go after Domingo Herman a lot with guys that don't strike out, right, and are going to be able to make a good bit of contact when they see this righty-righty change, for example, against right-handers. There's the 215 ISO that he gives up there, 1.8 homers per nine. And the curveball as well, right? And notably, that's, well, the best right-handed hitter for the Mets is, of course, uh, Pete Alonso. He's down to 4,500 now at Yankee Stadium against a guy that gives up power to the right side. Uh, let's do it. Um, I think he's one of the best plays of the day. Even though the power has kind of dropped off a cliff a little bit for PD this year, um, he did deal with the injury a little bit. And just kind of having a, a down season, well, it's not really all that surprising after a guy hits, what, 40, 50 jacks or whatever he hit last season. Um, nevertheless, he's 4,500, so sign me up. If you want to get to some short stacks of the Mets, I think this is okay going after Herman. I generally don't like full stacking against him. Uh, but you can go after that because he's still just throwing a two-seamer as well that's break-even for all intents and purposes, and he's got the bad four-seamer. So if the curveball and the change are floating a little bit, then at Yankee Stadium, baseball could really fly because he's already a fly ball pitcher with this arsenal. So uh, I've got no problem really getting to certainly short stacks of the Mets, um, even though it's not thrilling to stack this team generally because they are bad. Pete Alonso down to 4,500, basically um, 
you know, flips that whole narrative on its head. Frankie Lindor is still 4,800, so that's not great, but everybody else is under 4,000, so uh, I don't really care if I got to eat 4,800 on Frankie Lindor switch hitting at Yankee Stadium. He's still got okay numbers against right-handers this year. Not great, um, but the power is still there for him, and he's still a very dangerous and a very good hitter. So, full stacks, I got to side with the Mets here and certainly side with Verlander. They're only about $1.15 into betting markets right now. I think this is a pretty okay play if you want to go after uh, the Mets, but would not be surprised if Verlander also gives up you know, a little bit of production here, too. It's because of the strike one. He's not walking people, but once again, he's elevating his pitch count. So, um, uh, with some fly ballers here that have some weaknesses and attackable traits, I think you can get to a little bit of offense. Full stack's not my favorite, certainly compared to other teams here. If I got to choose, it's the Mets. Um, Maybe some one-off pieces of the Yankees, like a Glaber or a, I don't know, a DJ, Jake Bauer. I really don't want to play them, to be quite honest. So I, I got to side with Verlander here a little bit. Okay, let's move on to Colorado and Washington. And, well, if it weren't for the Pirates really destroying you Darvish last night, uh, Rockies were going to win tournaments. So we talked about them yesterday. It was a pretty good spot. They hit a lot of line drives, and... Patty Corbin gave up a lot of line drives to the right side, right? So gave up a lot of production. Didn't really come against him necessarily. It was certainly mostly against the bullpen. Um, but, you know, there's no way for us to really predict what kind of bullpen uh, arms that uh, opposing offenses are going to see in those types of games. The best we could do is take equitable spots, uh, call it pre-flop, if you will, and stack against a starter that has a little bit of a vulnerability, even though he may have survived last night. Rocky still got there, and I think we can do that once again tonight and go after Trevor Williams. Um, we're not going to be playing Austin Gomber, of course. I'm just going to kind of skip over him for the most part. 15% strikeout rate in a super bad matchup for swing and miss against the Nationals. He's got good uh, strike one, though. No chase, no swinging strikes, of course. So, you know, we're not thrilled about um, you know, playing Austin Gomber or anything. He's 6,200, and this is a full 12-game slate, so we're not doing it. However, over his last six starts, he's been very serviceable. He's going, what, five, a minimum of five innings in each of his last six starts. Um, and he even popped for a seven-inning outing at home, really, at Coors Field against Detroit, where he struck out seven. Now, that, that upside is probably about his ceiling, 25 points. That included a win. And, you know, five of his last six starts have included a team win as well. So they are, you know, his DFS performances are buoyed with an extra four points in there. So when you take that out, they're really not all that impressive, not all that impressive. So that's why we can't play him. That said, he could survive here because Washington's still a pretty bad offense, man. And even though they put up six runs or whatever yesterday, uh, for the most part, they're not going to accomplish that by hitting the baseball over the wall. Uh, with all that much regularity. However, they do have a couple of right-handers here that hit lefties very well, notably uh, Lane Thomas, right, up at the top of the lineup. He's still 4,800. Stone Garrett is still 2,700, right, below 3,000. Love playing those two guys. Uh, you can play Alex Call if you get all the way down there. Not my favorite playing a an outfield, you know, cheap outfield punt piece outside of stacks, you know, on full slates on a home team. Uh so if I had to choose, it'd be like Elaine Thomas throwing a Jamer if you want. Joey Maness is really, really difficult to play. The power's just totally gone. He's got like an 080 ISO, even against lefties this year. Still hitting for average, but uh, not so much in the power department. So that's what makes it hard to play, or what what makes full national stacks hard to play, I should say. So my favorites still, as they really have been the whole season, uh, Lane Thomas and, and Stone Garrett against left-handed pitching. And you can go after a couple of Gomber pieces here. Um, with the Nationals. So I think that's fine. On the other side, as I mentioned, we can get to the Rockies once again. Trevor Williams gives it up to both sides in terms of power for sure. He's got a 200 XI, so maybe running a bit cold there, about a tick, tick and a half or so compared to the realized numbers. Trevor Williams can be frustrating to stack against sometimes because he's about break even in everything outside of the changeup. He used to have a really, really good changeup uh, when he was in Pittsburgh in his early career. Um, you know, that change of value is totally evaporated. It's a horrible pitch now. Um, but the four-seamer, sinker, slider, curveball 
are, for the most part, respectable. Curveball, obviously, is just a show-me curve, and he gives up about two outs to the field on that. Um, so nothing overly impressive, and we like stacking against Trevor Williams, right, because he gives up fly balls. He's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. That gives up power, right? Full 200x ISO is a big number, and a 350x WOBA is a pretty big number. It's mostly lefties if we're looking for you know, high probability spots, right? Because he's only got an 11% strikeout rate to the left side and has a slightly higher line drive rate at 21% versus the 18, 19% line drive rate to the right side. A little okay against right-handers. He's still efficient early in the count, still doesn't walk a lot of guys, but he does give up barrels, right, at a full 10%, and that translates to the power. He'll give up some balls in the air, though, because he floats the four-seamer, floats the sinker a little bit, and same thing with the slider, just doesn't bury it enough to get ground balls and swing and miss to the right side, and that's what translates to the 2.1 homers per nine to the righties. So if you want to get to the Rockies again, I think they're very much in play. Now, this is a 12-game slate, far harder to get there with them on this size, um, but they're still in play because they're still cheap. Jerry Profar mentioned it yesterday. He's horrible against right-handed pitching from the left side of the plate, but he's 3,400, and this is a very high upside spot uh, for contact. Not so much in power, but he will pop on occasion and you know hit the ball over the wall. Um, I have to keep an eye on both Chris Bryant and C.J. Crone once again. Bryant's up at 4,700, not my favorite play there, but uh, it's an okay contact piece here. He's still hitting the ball in the air and still hitting the ball well, um, just not so much in consistency with all of the injuries he's dealing with. C.J. Crone, same thing with him. Keep an eye out. He's 4,300. He'd be a pretty good first base stack piece if you want to mix that in, if he is in the lineup. Um, Leas Diaz down to 4,000 now, finally starting to see the, the price tag uh, really start to accelerate to the downside, which we like to see. Um, but the favorites are, are definitely uh, Nolan Jones, Ryan McMahon. Ryan McMahon's 4,100 now. And it is a very, very good matchup for him. He makes some ground ball contact and strikeout. Uh, strikeouts are really his problem. So um, this is a good batted ball matchup for him in particular at third base. I think it's a, a really good price-adjusted third base play today. Same thing with Nolan Jones in the outfield, 3,900. You can get there too. And you can always play Zeke Tovar. He's back down to 3,500. So we got to keep an eye out for what they do with the lineup once again. But I've got no problem getting to Rocky stacks and going after some Trevor Williams, even though he can be frustrating to stack against sometimes due to lack of raw hard contact and lack of a raw sort of outsized walk rate uh, to both sides of the plate. He's still got pretty okay control, even though he's not going to throw it past people uh, and not going to wow us with swing and miss or anything like that. Just an 8% sing, uh, swing strike rate and 23% CSW. Just too much contact here from both guys. Gomber at 83%, Trevor Williams... Slightly north of that, also roughly 83%. Should be a lot of batted balls here. And the only thing we got to keep in mind um, with a, a game in Washington, right, in the middle of the summer is rain. I think we might have a little bit of a weather concern here. Um, it'd be nice if they just <laughs> scratched this whole game because uh, this is generally a, kind of a difficult spot for me to peg. Um you know, two bad arms, but two arms that I think might be able to, to survive against two bad offenses, right? So um, it's hard sometimes to get a ton of exposures to these guys, even though the numbers say, yeah, go ahead and do it. You know, the arms are good enough and the offense is bad enough that can make it a little bit frustrating to get there. So maybe they just wash the game out. We don't have to deal with it. Uh, that said, everybody, um, you know, offensively is certainly in play here. Okay, let's move on to Atlanta and Boston. Same thing here weather-wise. Uh, we're just going to analyze the game as if we didn't have any weather concern. Uh, Charlie Morton on the mound. I don't want anything to do with this tonight. I think the price tag is a little high for the matchup. Um, now, he's got a high strikeout rate against the left side, and that's all of the curveball swing and miss. He buries this right down back foot, gets it in under the hand sometimes when he gets it up into strikes out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we talked about this ad nauseum this season. The only good pitch for Charlie Morton is the curveball. Uh, he's got break-even, show-me slider value, but it's kind of a slur when he does this. Um, but the changeup's bad, four-seamer's bad, two-seamer's bad. If this curveball is not getting the same sort of value, he's not getting that any of that swing and miss, he could really get picked apart here against Boston. These guys do not swing and miss against right-handed pitching. 
certainly from the left side, outside of Jaron Duran and Tristan Casas. Uh, Verdugo doesn't strike out. Devers doesn't strike out. Yoshida doesn't strike out. So it's a difficult spot for him to really capitalize on a lot of the upside here at this particular price tag, 9300 in Fenway. Um, Justin Turner doesn't strike out from the right side. Adam Duvall will strike out. So that would be the one upside spot for him you know, from the right side. But now we've all of a sudden eliminated you know, five of the top seven hitters in terms of just raw floor for Charlie Morton. So uh, I think it's a super difficult spot to be playing him at 9,300. Um, he could pop, of, of course, because Boston uh, is kind of a, it, they're for the most part a break even offense, right? 105 WRC plus. It's just a lack of raw strikeout stuff. They'll hit for a little bit of power, but average hard contact, mostly neutral ground ball to fly ball, pretty average batted ball profile here. Uh, 331 Woba, it's slightly above average. But they create at a slightly above average clip. So uh, that, this all kind of makes sense. They don't walk a hell of a lot. I mean, Charlie is going to put them on base for free a little bit. 10% walk rate here. Um, and I think getting to some Boston sacks could be in play. Uh, mostly it's going to be my favorite here would be like a Devers, Duvall, Tristan Casas. You're going to want some fly ball hitters because Charlie still does induce ground balls with the curveball slider and a little bit of the change down in the strike zone sinker too. Um, so we want guys that can lift it, get it in the air. That's not Mastaki Yoshida, even though he doesn't strike out. He hits way too many ground balls. That's not Alex Verdugo. Hits too many ground balls, right? Jaron Duran strikes out that we established. Tristan Cassis is going to strike out, but he has a lot of power and he hits the ball in the air. Uh, Jaron Duran hits, you know, buck and a half ground balls per fly ball against righties himself. And he strikes out. So, um, Favorite here has got to be, you know, just a short stack, I think. Devers, Duvall, Tristan Casas. You can mix in a weird Justin Turner with second base eligibility. He's got first and second now. 4,400 if you get there. The only reason you could mix him into a stack is because he's still a slight fly ball hitter and doesn't strike out a lot. Uh, still got a little bit of pop, of course. This is in Fenway. And, well, he's got that second base eligibility. So I think that's okay. Three-man, short four-man. If you want to get to a full five-man uh, you can mix in a Yoshida because it didn't strike out. Um, and if the the stack works, then Charlie's not likely to be long for the game anyway. And then you get to the Atlanta bullpen. So, yeah, this is in Fenway against an attackable arm that's only got one good pitch here, and that's the curveball. So, uh, yeah, sign me up for a little bit of Boston if we can make it happen. Uh, Atlanta on the other side gets Brent Bernardino in all likelihood. I just got him here in the sheet. Um, you know, we're not really sure what Boston's doing here. They've been playing just kind of goofy games with Nick Pavetta coming out of the bullpen. And he's been fantastic coming out of the bullpen. So they want to keep doing that. So they've been running him out behind an opener in his last appearance, what, three, four days ago. He came out of the bullpen and basically just did his side session in a game, right? Just went one inning through like, I don't know, 15 pitches or something like that. Um, by most accounts, it's going to be him that will come in after Bernardino or whoever they open. Could be like a Chris Murphy or something like that. Who knows? So it's just going to be a bullpen game. I obviously don't want to go after Atlanta with anybody, even if it is Nick Pavetta, who's been fantastic uh, against or out of the bullpen. So do you want to get to Atlanta? I mean, sure, but you got to stomach 67 for Acuna. Finally, they're starting to jack his price up. And finally, they're starting to depress Ozzy Albi's price, 5,600. Um, he's far, far better from the right side. So he, that's actually a playable spot here. If he is going to get Brandon Bernardino in one of his at bats, if they want to bring in a Chris Murphy after that or something, if we, if we get any news later today, um, that could keep Ozzy Albies in play. Austin Riley's up to 59, but he's right-hander at Fenway. So sure. Um, Matt Olson still 63. So that's not my favorite. Sean Murphy, 57. Also very stiff for a catcher piece. So you still, as every day with Atlanta, you got to get to some guys down at the bottom third, um, bottom half, Ozuna, Rosario, Arcia, Michael Harris. So not my favorite getting to full Brave stacks. Um, once again, they just have to hit the baseball out because they don't create runs otherwise. It's only when they hit the baseball out, the only guy stealing bases is really Ronald Acuna still. So um, he's been a little bit colder recently. But 6,700 because the upside is still very much there, uh, especially when he gets a lefty in a 
pretty serious hitters ballpark. Once again, we got to keep an eye out for weather here. I'm really hoping they just wash out this game because, frankly, I'm tired of dealing with Atlanta getting there every damn night uh, when we're trying to play contrarian and cheaper stacks. Um, that said, a little bit of offense here. Certainly Atlanta. you got to have exposure to them every night. Um, and a little bit of Boston, too. And no Charlie Morton for me. Casey and Cleveland, Zach Greinke on the mound. Uh, we'll probably get through this pretty quickly. I, you just can't play Greinke on a 12-game slate, even at 5,600 uh, against Cleveland. It's just a total non-starter. He's not going to throw a bye anybody, but he's still very efficient early in the count and very efficient later in the count. Doesn't walk anybody. That makes him very difficult to stack against. We've talked about this with Greinke all season. Uh, he gives up three runs every freaking outing, and that's about it. He, he goes five innings, gives up two to three runs, and, and that's it, and you're left slamming your head in the door. Um because you've got outsized exposure to the opposing offense. I'm not doing it with Cleveland because they are a bad offense. They don't create a lot. They don't hit the baseball out. Um, however, at least recently, they've had some really good matchups, and they've capitalized on them. Against righties this season, their WRC Plus is all the way up to 94 now, which is damn shocking uh, considering how poor they were early in the season. They still don't hit for any power, sub-130 ISO, still no hard contact, 25% there, and still a lot of ground balls. So on a full 12-game slate, it's incredibly difficult to get super thrilled about going after an arm that I still respect to be able to suppress contact. Even though he's got a 5 and a half ERA or so, he's only got a 4 and a half XFIP with a super low strand rate for him. I think we got a little bit of positive regression coming for Grinky. That doesn't mean strikeout stuff. He's not going to throw it by anybody. Um but he's been giving up a little bit of power here, all really all season, you know, running right in line with his 195 X ISO, give or take. Same thing with the Woba, hovering right in line with where he should be based on batted ball metrics. Still getting give up average, right? Uh, and that's how Cleveland can get there. And they're very well priced. Josie down to 5,300. That's fine. Stephen Kwan, 38, doesn't have any power, but that's a fine, um, you know, leadoff outfield piece if you want to decide to get there. Um, so I've got no real issue getting to a couple of these lefties really like Josh Naylor, uh, in this particular spot. He's one of the few guys that does hit the baseball out. He's 4,000 at first base. You want to play Josh Bell as well. Mix in, if you got a lot of Cleveland exposure, mix in some stacks there. That's fine too at 2,800. Um, overall Cleveland, just a, a really unimpressive offense. So it's going to be hard to convince me that they have, the highest upside of any team on the day, they're popping in value as one of the best teams, if not the best team here in the early runs, but that's mostly because they're inexpensive and they get a guy that's you know, going to pitch to 85% contact. So I've got no problem playing Cleveland. My preference is certainly just short stacks, uh, Josie, Josh Naylor, and throw in your favorite whoever, Andres Jimenez down to you know 3,600, doesn't make any hard contact, that's hard. Uh, or maybe a Stephen Kwan up at the top. That's okay. Full stacks, though, really difficult to get there, though. Um, 7,200 for Aaron Savali on the mound. Yeah, sign me up. He gets the Royals, and this team is awful. I think they won yesterday. I, I'm not sure how. Uh, I'm really not sure how they've won 29 games this season. They're, they're just garbage. Uh, top to bottom. Um... So I want to play Savali in his previous, as I mentioned at the outset, in his previous outing against them this season... Uh, this was three starts ago, early, uh, what, week one of, the, of July here. He went seven innings, struck out nine, zero earned runs allowed, sprayed just two hits. He's fantastic early in the count. 70% strike one with 30% chase is elite tier. Given that he only strikes out 19% of guys, just a sub 10% swing strike right here, the CSW is still up at 28.5%. That's because of so many called strikes. He's got five and a half pitches call it with a little bit of a show me change but a full six that he's got in the repertoire that he can go to in any count and that's going to make it super difficult for the royals over here to really put together any type of production that said it is the second time they're seeing him this year and i generally side with the offense in those scenarios as you guys probably know by now um i have no problem playing a couple of royals pieces like a salvi perez who has hit dingers back to back to back days as a matter of fact perhaps seeing salvi start to heat up a little bit um mj still making a lot of hard contact even though he doesn't hit for any average and strikes out a crap load bobby witt still 4900 not my favorite there 
Um, it's got to be some lefties here or like a Salvi Perez. Michael Massey I like at 2,300. He's a nice five-hole second base piece that you can get to pretty much always. Uh, Nick Prado strikes out a crap load too. 2,800 down at first base. Not my favorite there. Um, so short stacks, singleton pieces for the Royals if you want to go after some Savali. But I'm going to side with him here. I think he's too cheap for this particular matchup, even though it is the second time he's seen them. He's the, I think he's a stone lock in cash. Um, we're always concerned with raw upside with Savali. But the strike one rate and the lack of a barrel rate is incredibly attractive. Um, you know, this, this offense is just awful over here, uh, for the Royals. So would not be surprised to see like a two, nothing game or a two, one game. Um, would also not necessarily be surprised to see Cleveland hop on Zach Ranky or the Royals hop on Savali a little bit and put up like a four or five spot against him. Um, overall though, that doesn't mean I want to be playing the offenses with any outsized exposures, mostly just Savali here for me and a little bit of Cleveland short stacks. Okay, let's move on. Seattle and Minnesota. Probably going to get to pitching once again uh, for the most part in this game tonight. Um, George Kirby on the mound, 8700 Kind of a fishy price tag. Man, I love this kid. He's so efficient early in the count, too. He doesn't walk anybody. This is the best walk rate for a starting pitcher in baseball. 2.5%. And he like, we got 19 starts. This is just absolutely elite control. Dude hates throwing balls right he just stays so in the strike zone this is why this the um the contact rate here is so high 81 percent it's just because he throws so many freaking strikes and we mentioned this ad nauseum with him this year too that's really the only knock on him he doesn't really have a raw swing and miss pitch against the left side he's got a little bit of the curveball which he induces um you know some some swing and miss with but he needs to change up. When he throws this, it's just not very good. Uh, it's a really strong velo delta, delta, full 10 miles an hour here, which is very attractive. Um, but he doesn't trust it a lot. And if he were able to develop out this change up um, or introduce perhaps a cutter and get a little bit more of a, um, a ground ball sort of lean against lefties or swing and miss against lefties, uh, that would make him like elite tier, kind of like, Arsenal-wise, Tyler Wells style, where it's just fantastic. But the difference would be that he didn't walk anybody, and he didn't give up the same sort of barrel rate that Tyler Wells does. Um, he'd have ground balls. He'd have swing and miss. He'd have everything. So the potential is there for George Kirby to really continue to grow here. This is only, what, his second season in, in the big leagues, I believe. So uh, I've got no problem playing him, guy that throws a hell of a lot of strikes against a team that's going to swing and miss a boatload over here in the Twins, 27.5% strikeout rate in 3,000 plate appearances against righties this year. I mean, yeah, let's do it. Just go after the Twins literally every single night. And we're only going to see about 12-15% ownership on Kirby tonight. I think this is fine. At 8700 I'd balk a little bit at the price tag. I'd like it a tiny bit cheaper to realize a, a bit more upside. Um... And the real problem here that I'm I'm seeing is that the Twins, they're still going to platoon. They'll have probably seven lefties in the lineup now that Byron Buxton is on the paternity list. Um, Willie Castro is back and healthy. We'll see what they want to do. They'll have Correa in there. They'll probably have, you know, they'll have their catcher in there, whoever it is, Jeffers or Christian Vasquez. Um, but they'll have seven lefties in there otherwise. And the, the strikeout rate is lower, down to 20%. He does give up 201 ISO to the left side there too, 34% hard with more fly balls. So that could put some of the twins in play here in short stacks. Eddie Julian is fine. I love playing him pretty much every day at 3,300. I'm going to continue to do it while he's this cheap. Alex Kirilov, same sort of deal, 2,700 for him. Max Kepler really seeing the baseball with Eddie Julian and Alex Kirilov getting on base a little bit more ahead of him. Max Kepler is hitting with runners on base and in scoring position, and that's where the production is coming from. 2800 it's a steal price when he's in the four hole here against a guy that's not going to throw it past him necessarily in George Kirby. And he's going to throw a lot of strikes. Same thing with Matt Walner. He's the stone mint at 2000 So a couple of these guys, these lefties over here, can be in play. I prefer short stacks or just one-offs. If you want to throw in a Carlos Correa at 4300 that's okay. Uh, but he's going to hit a lot of ground balls. Um, and probably not perform all that well against Kirby. So I think both sides are really in play here. I got a side with Kirby just because he's a better arm than this offense. Um, 
but I think some lefties, Julian Kirilov, Kepler, right there in the middle, are certainly in play. Pablo Lopez at 10-4 on the mound for the Twins. Uh, yeah, I like this too. 25% ownership is fine. The plate discipline here is elite. It, it's been elite really all season. We're actually looking for a bit of positive regression in terms of raw suppression for Pablo Lopez. Four and a quarter ERA here with a three and a half XFIP. The XERA pointing even south of that. Same thing with the Sierra, which I don't display here in the sheet here. Um, 70% strain rate, pretty low for Pablo, given that he's got a 30% strikeout rate, 71% strike one, 35% chase. North of 30% CSW is just elite. Everything in here in the plate discipline is fantastic. The only pitch that he gives up any equity to the field on is the curveball and maybe a little bit of the two-seamer both break even uh, with respect to the rest of the league. So I got no problems playing Pablo Lopez. Seattle is terrible, man. This offense is is break even at best. They are stone average in every single metric. Um, and sure enough, as we've mentioned several times this season with them, their record is reflecting that. So, uh, you know, who'd have thought? Um, 26% strikeout rate, though, and the raw 228 batting average are well below league averages there. So Pablo is not going to give up a hell of a lot of batting average, maybe a little bit more to the lefties. Um, they'll probably have four, maybe five lefties in there tonight. Colton Wong, if you want to even consider him a lefty. Uh, you're not playing him, though. Taylor Trammell, he's 2,000. You could play him. He's a fly ball hitter. Mike Ford has been fine recently. They might have him up at the top of the lineup as they do a little bit against righties and move Tay Oscar down, for example. Um, Cal Raleigh will, of course, be in there, and JP will be leading off as well. So if you want to get to a lefty here or there and get some leverage off of Pablo, that's okay. Um, price adjusted though, not my favorite. I'd probably rather, I don't know, get to maybe like a Tay Oscar. He's not going to give up barrels, Pablo. So that's unfortunate with Tay Oscar. And he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup, but he's 3,600. If he is in the four hole, Pablo will, you know, float some of this righty righty change on occasion. And it'll just kind of cement mixer the, the slider a little bit. Sometimes hang a curveball. Um, you know, not, this isn't like Joe Ryan elite tier, uh, you know, four seamer change type of stuff, but it, it's all well above average and still very good. So for the most part, not interested in Seattle. Uh, I want to get to as much Pablo as I can. It's just the price tag here that's going to keep us off. But 10-4 um, is still very much playable with this type of plate discipline in this type of matchup. So uh, no issues really getting to pitching really at all. Maybe some short stacks or leverage pieces, but... Um, Pitching for the most part. Okay, let's move on. Texas and Houston. Uh, you can sack this game again if you want to tonight. Uh, Cody Bradford's likely going to go for the Rangers. They're skipping Nathan Eovaldi's um, turn in the rotation. His velocity's been down. So they might you know, just try and give him a little bit of extra rest, either push him to uh, tomorrow, or maybe just skip him entirely and, and just kind of give him uh, – you know, a, a bit of a cool down period because he's been pretty good this season. So it's likely to be Cody Bradford opening. That's who I've got in here. Uh, could be in Owen White, who they brought up. He's a triple-A arm right-hander. Not a lot of upside, not a lot of swing and miss. Um, so that means you could play Houston, right, on the other side because they are very likely to get Jordan Alvarez back tonight, even though they didn't activate him yesterday. No idea what the hell Dusty Baker is doing down there. Um Jordan Alvarez is 5000 This is a steal price. Uh, shit, I, I might even play him if he isn't activated because, just because he's 5000 You know, he's, he's that much of a steal at this price tag. Um, so even if he isn't in the lineup, I'm, I'm going to play him anyway because, uh, you know, I really, really love 5000 for him. Um, you know, that said, it's Kyle Tucker, it's Jordan Alvarez if you want to play some of the lefties here. But if it's Cody Bradford coming in, um, you know, an opening for them that takes me off of Kyle Tucker at 6,300 just at the price tag. Not that he's a bad hitter or anything, but, um, you know, if you want to get to some stacks here and go after a young Owen White too, that's fine. Um, especially if Jordan is back, they, as we talked about with judge and a little bit yesterday about Jordan changes the, the whole complexion of the lineup, um, back in here because he makes everybody else better. So, I've got no problem going after whoever the Rangers have here, whether it's Bradford or uh, or White, and not certainly not playing either one of them. J.P. France, 8,100. I think he is too expensive uh, to 
be playing against Texas, uh, even though they're missing missing Corey Seager, I don't really care because his major problem, JP France, is power to the right side. And this game is in Houston, and you can throw it out from home plate um, when you're in Houston into the Crawford boxes down there. you got to hit it 315 to hit it out. It's a high school field. It's like Yankee Stadium down there. He gives up 1.9 homers per nine, 080 ground balls per fly ball, and a full 202 ISO to the right-handers. Uh, let's do it with a 21% line drive rate. That's Marcus Semien. That's Addy Garcia. That's Josh Young territory. Zeke Duran is a pretty damn good play as well. Uh, 3,300. He's got shortstop eligibility now. Um, as he had earlier in the season when Corey Seager was out, so they moved him back down into the infield. You can play Leote a little bit from the right side too. Uh, and sure, you can play Nate Lowe or Travis Jankowski up at the top of the lineup because they're up at the top of the lineup and they're left-handed. Um, he does, J.P. France, have a very good cutter or a break-even cutter and a very good changeup, I should say. So he will induce a little bit more, you know, ground ball type of contact, excuse me, and rollover type of contact with those two pitches and some ground balls, right? Two and a half ground balls per fly ball against the lefties. So... It's a little difficult to stomach a Travis Jankowski, even in, though he's in the two-hole. He hits two ground balls per fly ball himself um, against right-handers. Same thing with Nate Lowe, a little bit of a ground ball lead, so not my favorite first base play. So I'd rather get to like some short stacks of right-handers here and just homer hunt with like a semi and Addy Garcia, Josh Young type. You can play Jonah Heim behind the plate because he switch hits. That's no problem at 4,400. He's been great from both sides, and he hits the baseball in the air. Uh, but as I mentioned, Zeke Duran, probably price adjusted. I think he's got to be the favorite. Um, maybe Josh Young again, who hit a ball out yesterday. Addy Garcia as well. Uh, really like the right-handers here against J.P. France. No pitching here for me uh, pretty much at all. And I like game stacks if you can make it happen. Okay, since he in Milwaukee, Andrew Abbott on the mound for the Reds. And Burns going for uh, the Brewers. Um, now, this is, what, the third matchup of these two guys alone in the last month. Um 9,500 for Abbott. You know, we talked about this in, what, two starts ago when he saw the Mil Milwaukee for, what, I think the second or the third time, sec second time, and he gave up six runs in, what, the first two innings. Um, the Brewers have seen him three times this season. He's still 9,500. He still has a 95% strand rate. Still has a 210 ERA with a 4.5 XFIP. He still has a whip south of one. Um, and he's still giving up, look at this, 036 ground balls per fly ball in aggregate, and that's over 213 hitters seen this season. That is concerning because he's giving up 37% hard contact to the right side. So when we get hard contact and fly balls at this type of rate, uh, that's really concerning. This is still a hitter's ballpark. It's not Cincinnati, but it's still Milwaukee, and it plays up offense pretty well. I'm concerned at 9,500 for him. I think he's still too expensive for the regression that I know is coming, and it's probably going to start coming in bunches. And who better for it to come against than a team he's seen four times this season? This is the third time in the last month that he is getting Milwaukee. And after a while, uh, I don't care how bad your offense is against left-handed pitching, and they're bad. Let's not get it confused. 27% strikeout rate, 86 WRC plus, 150 ISO, 33% hard with ground balls. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball for the Brewers against lefties. Um, you know, eventually when you see a guy so many times in such a short time frame, as they've seen him three times in a month, you're just going to see the baseball better. You're going to be able to perform a little bit better because after a while, you know, pitchers can't just all of a sudden develop a cutter or develop a splitter and and go to work with six different pitches and mix up everything that they throw every single outing, right? They've only got the four pitches that they've got, and that's pretty much it. So if you've seen them four times, you know what they're going to throw at you. So it's just a slightly higher probability that a guy that's got some regression coming to him against a team that's seen him so much is more likely to get picked up, picked off, right? And 9,500, I think you're taking a, a, a good bit of risk here. That said, I do like the strikeout stuff, of course, and I do like the matchup in general. Um, I don't like the fact that they've seen each other so much. Same thing with Corbin Burns on the other side. Now, I'm not as concerned with Corbin Burns. Number one, he's cheaper. Um, 
well, I'm more concerned with the ownership, of course, right? If I got to choose between the two, I'd just play Abbott at 95 at 7% ownership uh, because I think the upside is probably similar. It's maybe even higher for Andrew Abbott. Um, Corbin Burns, though, is 35% owned, and he gets Cincinnati, who's actually been one of the four best teams in baseball since June 1st. Uh, I know that because I was looking up the, you know, the judge splits or team splits or team splits since judge went out, that is. And Cincinnati is right up there at the top. Since they brought all these kids up, Ellie, Matt McClain, and they got everybody healthy, Joey Votto, Jake Fraley, uh, and TJ Friedel, who's been great over the last month too. CES down in the seven hole now. Uh, he's basically a lock in the in the lineup. Um, do you want to be playing? I'd rather be playing him tonight than Joey Votto, as a matter of fact, because Corbin Burns, his elite pitch or elite combination here is the cutter change curveball. Right, that's what keeps him so far down in the strike zone against lefties. Buck 80 ground balls per fly ball with 22% soft contact. 092 ISO allowed with a 29% strikeout rate against lefties. He is elite, elite, elite against the left side. So that takes me off of Ellie De La Cruz, takes me off of uh, TJ Friedel and Jake Fraley and Joey Votto. So I want righties if I'm going to go after Corbin Burns. And as I mentioned, this is the fourth or third time they've seen him this month um, and and this season. So same sort of spiel uh, applies to Corbin Burns here on the other side. And it makes it a hell of a lot easier to fade because he's 35% owned. That said, I do really like the 9,200 for him because he still has a lot of upside in this matchup because of the strikeout stuff. However, good hitters from the right side, Matt McClain, he'll, he'll strike out a little bit, so it's not so much that, but he's going to make contact, and he's a good hit tool. Um, Johnny India down to 4,300. He's got to be the favorite from the right side price adjusted here because he's going to be able to you know, lift the baseball a little bit in this particular matchup against Burns, and he's a playable 4,300 now. Um, and CES as well, as I mentioned, at 3,000. Tyler Stevenson, no thank you at 4,200. Too expensive, and I don't really want the lefties. So no Will Benson. So that's how I'd like to attack Corbin Burns if I'm leveraging. It'd probably just be a one-off here or there, but you can always play Ellie. I mean, he's 5,800. This is a bad matchup, uh, but he's Ellie Dela Cruz. He's got probably... Just as much upside as like a Ronald Acuna, uh, not with the same regularity, of course, but you know the the raw upside is there. So you can play some of these lefties. That's not bad, but I prefer right-handers if I'm going to leverage against Corbin Burns. I got no problem playing him, of course, but not at 35% ownership. I think I just come in under uh, at that figure. Okay, let's move on. Chicago and Chicago. Look at that in the um, Windy City series, I suppose. I forget what they call this. Um, 6,800 on the mound for Kyle Hendricks. I got a weird feeling here, man, that Kyle Hendricks, this is the matchup where Kyle Hendricks at 1% ownership actually pops for 30, and he's just blast through the White Sox over here. Um, and it's mostly because of the good changeup. We've talked about this ad nauseum with him in every start. He's got fine secondaries, or a fine secondary with the changeup. Doesn't really throw a lot of the curveball. Um so the swing and miss isn't likely to be there for him really pretty much ever uh, with Kyle Hendricks. Uh, 6,800, though, I think this is going to have to put him in play, um, even though I really, you know, if I land on it type of in play, I did, I'm not going out of my way to play Kyle Hendricks on a 12-game slate. But the White Sox over here, um, you know, against a changeup in particular, they're giving up three-quarters of an out to the field and that is the third worst number in all of baseball. Um, and despite the fact that you generally don't want to be throwing a righty-righty change, Kyle Hendricks doesn't have anything else. That's his only you know, secondary pitch you know, to the fastball, so he will be throwing it righty-righty. And I think this is an okay spot. I think this pitch can play for him. Um, I don't think the four-seamer is going to play, of course. And I think the, the sinker can play a little bit here as well. They don't have a lot of left-handers. Um, they do have Benintendi and Grandal, Gavin Sheets, Oscar Colas. But, like, are we really scared of these guys? Uh, not necessarily with, the, with such a good pitch in the changeup from the left side. So um, that sinker's going to play. The changeup's going to play to both sides. And I think that has to put him in play here. It's super, super low ownership. He's similar to, like, a Graham Ashcraft last night that we talked about. Now, it's that the, the outing's... Most often, not going to wow you, uh, but I think he's got to be in play if you land on something here in this range. 
Uh, it's not just the exact same 6800 price tag that attracts me to it. I really, really like this changeup. Uh, Michael Kopech on the other side. We can get through this real quickly. I'm not touching this. 14% barrel rate or a walk rate and a 14% barrel rate. He does have strikeout stuff at 25%. It's really outsized to the lefties. Um, more attackable in terms of raw contact with right-handers, but I don't care. He's only got 55% strike one himself with 26% chase. 27% CSW, yeah, okay, but I don't care when you walk 14% of guys with a 14% barrel rate. Just no thank you. I'm not going anywhere near it. He's been awful, and we've actually got more negative regression coming to him in the raw suppression, perhaps not in the strand rate, uh, strand rate's high because he does have swing and miss, but he's walking way too many people. It's similar to Blake Snell, who we'll get to in a minute. The strand rate is high because most of the guys he's putting on base are coming via the walk, and then he's striking them out. He doesn't give up a lot of batting average, but it's just that he walks so many freaking people, and he gives up dingers, full 1.8, 1.9 homers per nine this season, and a raw 5% homer rate. Uh, no thank you. Not going anywhere near it. Cubs are one of the top stacks of the day. Do you want to get off of them because they're uh, popular and a bad offense? Well, yeah, sure. I got no problem with that. They're probably going to be a little bit too popular for their relative upside uh, because they're not going to hit for a lot of batting average. As I mentioned, Kopech still suppresses production in that respect. He just gives up pop and he walks the whole country. Um, but a 99 WRC plus against righties here this season for the Cubs, not impressive. And the left-handers here are going to strike out a lot. Talkman, Bellinger, um, Master Boney down at the bottom, going to strike out. Tucker Barnhart going to strike out. The right-handers that don't strike out is who I'd rather get to with the depressed strikeout rate for Kopech. That's like a Nico Horner, uh, say a Suzuki type. But those guys are kind of going to swing and miss a little bit here too. So... Do you want to play Kopech? Absolutely not. I, I mean, I certainly don't. Could I I'd see him pop for 22 points here and not walk everybody? Yeah. But, I mean, the only problem is being able to throw strikes, get ahead, and counts. We talked about this with many starting pitchers, as we talked about with Verlander. We'll go over it again with Snell. It's the same thing with Michael Kopech here. It's like, if you throw strike one... You put yourself in equitable counts, then it allows you to work to your plus secondaries and your plus strikeout stuff. Uh, if you can't do that, then you totally botch any uh, relative upside for you to you know, last deep into a game. And as we see here, only five and a third per start, and he's still throwing 90 pitches. So uh, I just can't do it until Michael Kopech turns around to walk rate. In his last outing, walked four. In his last uh, the three outings, actually, walked four in each, I believe. Um, I am spouting that from memory. The uh, last two outings, actually, walked four in each, walked seven against the Angels before that, walked three against Texas, walked six against Seattle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. However, in his good outings, the five starts before that, walked one, walked one, walked two, walked one, walked zero, right? So it's, it's pretty obvious that you just got to throw the damn baseball over the plate and not walk everybody, and then you can have a good outing. Kopech has that in the tank, 7,100. The walk rate is getting kind of priced in here. So if you want to take a super deep tournament shot on him, he has the upside as long as he can throw a strike. Uh, that, that's really it. Um, but I think getting to some Cubs here, I'm probably mostly interested in short stacks uh, where they're well-priced. Talkman, Ian Happ, Cody Bellinger is okay at 46, say Suzuki as well. Dansby Swanson, think that's fine too, since he his main problem against righties is his strikeouts. Uh, and Nico, of course, at 4,800. So that's how I'd kind of like to play it here. Um, maybe a little bit of Kopech, but like, good God, super gulpy. Okay, Pittsburgh and San Diego. Um, no rich hill for me. 6,100, I, no thanks. He's got a 10% barrel rate himself, 57% strike one himself, 23% chase rate. No thanks. 19% um, raw Ks against San Diego. That's really, you need swing and miss against them. And uh, we saw that last night. And... I'm, you know, with Quinn Priester, he survived a little bit, I, I suppose, but um, Rich Hill probably going to be a, a similar type of match, or definitely a similar type of matchup. He's throwing a lot more junk, right? do, but doesn't really have a raw swing and miss pitch either. That's how you have to uh, attack the Padres. So let's go right back to it. Hassan Kim hit two jacks last night. Finally, finally, finally seeing him start to really round into form, having come over from, I believe it was the Heroes, in the KBO, this is why they posted him, um, or why he 
you know, preferred to come over to Major League Baseball. Uh, this kid can play. He is a very, very good hitter. And when now that he's comfortable with the velocity and the change in breaking type of arsenals, um, breaking and off-speed arsenals over here in, in the big leagues, he's only had, what, two, three seasons now. He was still in the KBO during COVID, right? So um, now that he's up here and leading off, uh, this is a good, good hitter, man. And while he's in the low 4,000s, you got to play him pretty much every day, certainly against a left-hander. Uh, but you can play him against righties, too, as we saw last night. Tatis, you know, with, with Hassan Kim really turning things over at the top of the lineup, he's he's going to get on base. And at, similar to an Aaron Judge, Jordan Alvarez type of conversation, Hassan Kim's going to make all of these guys better, and it forced pitchers to throw to them. Tatis, Soto, Machado, Bogarts, you really want to be – forced into uh, bad situations with runners on base against these guys. I mean, good God. Super difficult matchup. We're not doing it with Rich Hill. So give me the Padres once again and everybody. Um, I have no problem really playing anybody outside of maybe Jake Cronenworth. Don't really like a lefty-lefty matchup. Soto, 57, not super jacked about it, but he walks enough and steals a few bases that it, it's okay. Um, so mostly the righties and Hassan Kim, Tatis, Manny, Bogarts, Gary Sanchez. Yeah, sure, go ahead. But mix in lefties, too, because Rich Hill, unlikely to be super long for this game. Um, 10,000 for Blake Snell. Here's the strike one walk rate conversation with him as well. And we talked about this ad nauseum, so I'm not going to go over it you know, too terribly with Blake Snell. But he just has to throw strike one. And in, over his last 12 starts, the strike one number is well north of 65%. However, over his last five starts, he's up, down, up, down, up, down in terms of the strike one rate under 50%, up above 65%. So there's the variance is still in there with Blake Snell, and I hate playing him at very high ownership at a very expensive price tag. So he's no longer in the mid-8,000s. He's no longer completely ignored. I'm going to come in underweight here, even though the matchup against Pittsburgh is fantastic. I love the secondaries here with the change-up slider curveball, but he has to be able to throw strikes. And sure enough, in his last outing against Pittsburgh, this was one of the good appearances for him. That really kind of kicked off his run. Um, actually, it was right in the middle of this run, really. Uh, he was 10-3 in the last outing, went six innings, struck out 10, and he had a 75% strike one rate. He has to be able to do this. You have to be able to throw strike one. That's always his issue. Uh, so I'm going to come in under. I prefer to get to Pablo Lopez uh, instead. I, I just don't trust him still. Um, even though this is a very good matchup, we saw what an offense can do against a guy that profiled very well and but just didn't have his A-plus stuff. And if Blake Snell doesn't have his A-plus stuff, I'm not eating this kind of ownership on him. Um, this is how you got to play the waves and play the uh, the markets in DFS, and this is how I choose to do it with Blake Snell. So if it bites me in the ass, it bites me. But um, this is how I like approaching it. And it's worked, for the most part, pretty well with him all season. So that's how I'm going to approach it. Uh, if you want to get to some leverage stacks against Snell, yeah, go ahead. You got my blessing. I don't really care. Um Connor Joe, absolutely. 3,000. I love this. He's got fantastic numbers against lefties this season. Not so much for Brian Reynolds. 5,400 now. Like, that's way too expensive. Um, Andrew McCutcheon at 4,500. That's okay. Carlos Santana hit two bombs last night as he was inserted into the lineup late. Henry Davis is fine in the outfield, too. Uh, ND behind the plate is fine at 2,100. Jared Triolo, third base. Punt piece at 2,500. Fine in full stacks. Uh, are the Pirates going to win tournaments for you two nights in a row against two really good arms? Um, yeah, well, I mean, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I probably wouldn't count on it. So not my favorite going after Snell in general because he does still have a lot of swing and miss here. It's just the walk rate that's the problem. So, um, sure, leverage stacks are fine. But for the most part, just give me the Padres and, you know, maybe a little bit of the Pirates. And under on Blake Snell. Uh, okay, St. Louis and the D-back Steven Matz, absolutely not. Um, a 170 ISO against righties, 22.5% strikeout rate, that's fine. But a 300 batting average and a 357 Woba, it's not fine. Buck 40 ground ball to fly ball, it's fine. 35% hard contact, not fine. So his problem's always, always, always been two right-handers. It's because his entire career he's only thrown the two-seamer. And nobody at in St. Louis, in New York, they've never told him to stop throwing the two-seamer and introduce a four-seamer or introduce a cutter or something. Uh, I have no idea why. This is a garbage pitch. It's break-even relative to league average, and the sinker's a bad pitch as it is. So 
I know he's semi-efficient early in the count. He's got okay chase at 28%. 28% CSW is fine also, um, but I'm not touching him against Arizona. I want to play Lourdes Gurriel. I want to play Christian Walker. I want to play Evan Longoria, who I think is probably price-adjusted the best third-base play of the day. Any of the catcher pieces, they've got seven catchers down there or whatever. Um, it is Jose Herrera, however, and Carson Kelly, so either one of those guys since... Um, Gabby Marino is on the DL now with a with a bad shoulder. Nick Ahmed, you can play against lefties who has historically he, he's got good numbers against the sinker uh, over his career. Um, historically hit left-handers really well. He's 2600. You want to play him? Stacks go ahead. Same thing with Cattell Marte. No problem playing him from the right side as well. And Corbin Carroll, absolutely. So all of the D-backs once again. Um, Steve Matz is a well below average left-hander, and they've got a 94 WRC+, plus, but a 21% strikeout rate, and sneaky, sneaky good against lefties are the D-backs. So I prefer short stacks here, Gurriel, Walker, Longoria, uh, but mix in any of uh, the rest of the lineup, I don't really have any problem. I'm going to get to as much, as, it, uh, as much of it as I can. Merrill Kelly will be back tonight. He is starting at 9,000. Um, you know, on the mound for the D-backs. This is a difficult matchup. I want to be careful with this. It wasn't an arm issue or anything. It was a calf. Uh, but he's been out for a month, and as far as I know, has not gone out on a rehab. Um, that's fine. He only hurt a calf. You know, he doesn't necessarily need a rehab. Uh, but what a calf can do for a starting pitcher, um, even though it's not an arm injury, right, it can throw off the mechanics a little bit. So we got to be careful. I want to be careful a little bit with it in a down strikeout matchup, down batted ball matchup, really. Uh, going after the Cardinals here, this is super dangerous offense, too. 9000 I'm not super thrilled with the price tag, but I love playing Merrill Kelly at 7.5%, very low ownership, as I always do. I've talked about this ad nauseum with him this season. Um, he's got a really good cutter, really good change, and that keeps the lefties completely off of the board here. He induces a lot of ground balls. However, he gives up a 41% hard contact rate. And that's a notable figure. So if you want to get to a fly balling type of lefty, um, no, that's okay. Brent Donovan's going to hit a lot of ground balls. Lars, maybe he was back. Looks like the heel was just fine. He did play last night. Nolan Gorman's been dealing with a back. That's why he's been out of the lineup. Um, he will get the baseball in the air a little bit if he's in the lineup. That's okay. But he's still got Miro Kelly, some outside strikeout stuff to the upside. 26% in aggregate here. It's to both sides of the plate. I got no problem playing Miro Kelly at 9,000, even against the Cardinals. I generally, at very low ownership, don't care all that much about a matchup unless it's like the Dodgers or something, um, and he's 9,800. He's 9,000 here. I think this is very attainable price-wise. I think the projection, the value score so far, and certainly the ownership are what mostly attract me to him. Overall, plate discipline is good, and I've got no problems, um, you know, playing a Merrill Kelly. I do want to be careful with it. Don't want to get 25% of any of him or anything, uh, because the the calf and you know lower leg injuries, ankles, calves, quads sometimes have a tendency with starting pitchers to throw off the mechanics a little bit. So this is a dangerous spot. If you want to just totally fade it, and if he pops, he pops. Well, you're not sacrificing all that much because he's not that popular. So. Um, that's fine if you want to play it that way. I think I'm going to try and get a little bit of exposure here because I love playing him at lower ownership. I, he still has 25 in the tank, even in a bad matchup. And at 9,000, that's very serviceable on a 12-game slate. So I've got no problem getting there. So mostly Arizona here. But if you want to play a fly-balling lefty or, I mean, I don't want to play Goldschmidt or Arenado at these price tags against Merrill Kelly um, necessarily. Good, probably be Arenado if I had to choose between the two because Goldschmidt's 6,100. Um you know, so not my favorite, but a little bit of of St. Louis here if you want to, you know, play the, the let's fade Merrill Kelly game and go after that. I don't think that's a horrible approach necessarily at all, but mostly uh, just the D-backs here. And you got to lay only a dollar twenty-five on them in the betting markets. That does suggest that Merrill Kelly might struggle here a little bit to me because Stephen Matz I think is just awful, and the D-backs, you know, they don't create a hell of a lot against left-handed pitching. I think it's a really high upside spot for him. Um, so I like getting two stacks there. As I mentioned, Longoria is certainly the price-adjusted favorite in the game. Okay, Oakland-San Francisco. We can probably get through this pretty quickly, too. No Ken Waldachuk. I can't do it. Even at 5,200, could he survive against the Giants? Yeah, maybe. 
but he doesn't have any strikeout stuff. Against lefties, he does, but the Giants are going to platoon. They do have some healthy right-handers here, and they're going to have probably seven, maybe even eight of them in the lineup tonight. So I can't do it. He still gives up a 207 ISO and a 393 Woba with a 308 batting average against righties this season. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. He's gotten the hard contact and the barrel rate under control against right-handers, which is, you know, attractive, but he's still will float the change up here with a bad four-seamer, bad change, um, and a bad slider, too. Doesn't really have a raw swing and miss pitch against the right side, and that's why we see him at just a 20% with a bad change up. That's just, there's just no swing and miss there. So that's why he gives up 1.7 homers per nine. Um, 13% walk rate, though, but that, because it's to both sides of the plate. So I'm not dealing with the 5,200 Ken Waldachuk. If you want to play some of the Giants, it's it's got to be just short stacks for me. I hate playing this team in San Francisco. It's 65-degree weather at night. I, I just can't do it. Um, but I do like Wilmer Flores. He'll be able to get the baseball in the air here a little bit. And Austin Slater is a pretty, you know, he's got pretty good numbers against lefties. Um, J.D. Davis, he hits a lot of ground balls. It's an okay matchup here. Um Probably not my favorite third base play at 4,200. But you can play Patty Bailey, Luis Matos, um, David Villar, Casey Schmidt. You want to mix in any one of these guys, it's all right. Uh, I'd probably prefer to just stay to the top half of the lineup and maybe just singleton pieces like an Austin Slater, Wilmer Flores. Patty Bailey uh, is a late sort of catcher piece if you want to get there. That's fine. Alex Cobb on the mound for the Giants, 7,600. Yeah, sign me up. Let's do it. I love the ground balls. I love the strikeout stuff against right-handers. Um, now, Oakland's going to platoon here a little bit, and that's what would take me off of super outsized exposures to him. But I've got no problem getting to 20% Alex Cobb here. The strike one rate is at 69%. That's elite tier. 31% chase. That's mostly coming from the splitter curveball combination. He stays down with the ground balls and the two-seamer here. So I'm really attracted to a lot of the plate discipline and the ground ball numbers for Alex Cobb. He's only given up a 167 ISO to the right side, he's got an aggregate, roughly, uh, buck 22 ISO, running perhaps a, a little bit hot there, um, you know, but it's only a 3% delta, and it's still a 150 X ISO, so it's not, nothing terribly concerning here or anything. Um, could he give up a couple runs here? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, he's still got a high strand rate, 80%. With so many ground balls, that's going to come down a little bit. It's still sustainable for a guy with this high a ground ball rate an 80% strand rate or, you know, upper 70s strand rate. 80% though in, in itself is just not sustainable overall. So if that's how you want to go after Alex Cobb, um, I mean, I don't want to play any of these guys. You want to play Seth Brown? Sure. He's a fly ball hitter against right-handers, and he's got dual eligibility now at first in the outfield. So that's fine. At 3,200, you can play J.J. Bladé. He'll get the baseball in the air a little bit too. Soderstrom first and catcher piece. You can play him uh, as a $2,600 filler if you want to do that. Jace Peterson, a little bit of pop from third base, $3,000. Uh, probably only a late slate play, though. It is a four-game late slate tonight, so we'll try and get projections up for that. Um, that would put Oakland in play here because Alex Cobb very likely to be about you know 55% owned on the late slate. So that's fine as a leverage play. On the main slate, not so much. I'd rather just play Cobb. And the Giants, where I can make it happen outside of a singleton piece, uh, of Oakland. Okay, let's move on. To last game of the night here. Uh, we run pretty long. Chris Bassett and uh, Julio Urias for Toronto and the Dodgers, respectively. No Chris Bassett whatsoever for me. He is garbage against left-handers, and they're going to have probably six or seven lefties in the lineup with the uh, absence of J.D. Martinez. He won't be in there. We'll actually keep an eye on it. Um, you know, he's dealing with the hammy or whatever. He, he, they might just give him another day off against a right-hander who's very good against right-handers. Uh, Mookie, you can always play. I don't really care about that. He's a fly ball hitter, and he's Mookie Betts. He's 6,600, though, so not my favorite second base outfield play, certainly. Uh, Freddie Freeman, though, and Max, Mun Max Muncy really heating up. And this, we're back in Max Muncy territory where he starts hitting the baseball out every single freaking at bat. And it doesn't matter what his price tag is. You just got to play him every night. So if you don't have exposure to him, I think that is a mistake. Um, 48 is certainly in this matchup against Chris Bassett. Uh, he's got to be outside of Freddie Freeman. I mean, they're certainly the top two value plays from the Dodgers. Um, even considering their elevated price tags, this is that good a spot against Chris Bassett. So I want nothing to do with him whatsoever. And I would like to get to some Dodgers, but I don't like stacking, full stacking against Chris Bassett generally because he's so good against right-handers. Um, 
and they're still going to have Mookie Betts and Will Smith up at the top of the lineup. So that, you know, he can suppress contact from those guys. So it's Freddie Freeman, Max Muncy, and whoever in the outfield, Peralta, Jason Hayward, doesn't really matter. You can play both of them. Um, probably prefer David Peralta, but both of their batter ball profiles. James Outman's fine, too. All three of them, you know, from the left side, you know, they profile pretty well here against Chris Bassett, not just because they're left-handed. So no uh, no Bassett for me whatsoever. Julio Urias, he's been really struggling, man. I think the price tag's a bit too high here. Um, 9,600, I love him at low ownership. I really, really do. But uh, and against lefties, Toronto's really not all that impressive, right? 103 WRC plus, 19% strikeout rate. So that's where you know they're going to be able to make some contact. But a buck 15 ISO? Are you kidding me? With all these right-handers, like, what are we doing against lefties? 750 PAs, maybe that number is going to tick up. But like, good lord, it's so bad. 29% hard contact. This is why with a you know buck 40 ground ball to fly ball. This is why you could consider Julio Urias on the main slate at sub 5% ownership. Elite strike one still, good chase at 30%, 28.5% CSW is fine, doesn't walk anybody, still has 23% strikeout rate, to really to both sides of the plate. It's about 22 to the righties, but like whatever. His problem here, and what would kind of take me off outside of the price tag, is the batted ball profile here, ground ball to fly ball ratio. Um, he's still giving it up in spades to left-handers. I'm not really worried about that necessarily. Um... It's, you know, all these righties that are going to hit the baseball mostly on the ground and on a line that really kind of concern me. So I think a lot of the upside is kind of priced in at 9,600. If you want to play some late slate Urias, nobody's going to be playing him down there. I haven't looked at ownership on the late slate just yet, but, um, you know, he's not going to be more north of 20% or anything like that because you've got Snell, you've got Kelly, you've got Alex Cobb, uh, et cetera. So um, maybe he pushes 20, 25% or something, but it's still a pretty damn good play there. On the main slate, yeah, maybe a little bit fishier, um, but far more palatable on the late state to get to pretty much all of the Dodgers, given their price tags. I, I want not a lot to do with uh, Toronto tonight. Um, you know, Bobuchet should be back, but he's 5,700 from 51. Don't know where this freaking price bump came from. Uh, Vladdy, 55. Chapman, 51. Um, you know, from the right side, I don't really want to go after Julio Urias for the most part. He does give up a little bit of pop, so sure, go ahead. Uh, that'd be like a Vladdy uh, or a Bo Bichette, maybe a Springer, but they're at their normal price tags in a below-average matchup, I would say. Uh, even though the numbers for Urias have been poor this season, um, I think having a little bit of time to clear his head uh, on the DL is going to do him pretty well. And, you know, he is not this bad. These are these numbers, the plate discipline numbers are really what he is, but he is not a 5-0 ERA with a four and a quarter x type of guy. So we got positive regression coming for Urias tonight, and against a team that's not going to hit the baseball down a line in a gap or over the wall against left-handers, I think it's a fine tournament spot if you want to land on this. Nobody is going to have him, so if you're very chalky elsewhere with like the Cubs and, I don't know, Cleveland or something like that, or San Diego or, or whatever it is, um then, yeah, sure, mix in a, a Urias if you land on it. I got no problem with that. Okay, that's it for the breakdown. Let's go over a quick review here. Mets, Yankees, Verlander, I like. Domingo Herman, I also kind of like a little bit. Um, but these guys are fly ball pitchers at Yankee Stadium with some weakness and some strike one problem. Not necessarily for Herman, but certainly for Verlander. Prefer Verlander and a little bit of the Mets. I really like Pete Alonso, 4,500. I think he's the best. I, he's like a, a lock in cash today, I think, uh, at that price tag. Um so a little bit of offense here, but mostly pitching, I think. Interesting tournament game. Colorado and Washington think the Rockies are in play once again against Trevor Williams. Lefties more so this this time compared to last night. Uh, really like Ryan McMahon, third base play. Uh, very well price adjusted tonight at 4100 And you play Nolan Jones too, 3900 He had a good night last night. Maybe a, jur a jury pro far, but like, bleh, he's garbage against right-handers. Um, you want to mix in a righty too. Keep an eye out for whoever is back tonight, whether it's Chris Bryant or C.J. Crone. Could be both of them. Could be neither of them. Um, Zeke Tovar, yeah, he's down to 3,500, and I'm going to keep playing him. I don't really care uh, if he's hitting – if he's sitting. Uh, he's this good of a young hitter. Um, I really like playing him at 3,500, so going to continue to do that. Atlanta and Boston, uh, needless to say, no pitching in the in the Colorado game. Atlanta and Boston, I'm off of Charlie Morton here at 9,300 against Boston. Like some short stacks against – um, against Charlie uh, in Fenway tonight. I think this is okay. 
Um, as I mentioned, Devers and Duvall, like a Tristan Casas, that's my favorite, but mix in, you know, a guy here or there, whoever you'd like. Um, you need some guys that are going to be able to lift it against Charlie. He still induces ground balls. Uh, no pitching, whoever it is here, whether it's Pavetta or Bernardino um, from Boston. You want to play Atlanta? Yeah, go ahead. It's price tags are going to keep you off, though. But you got to have exposure in some manner. Uh, one-offs at the very least of Atlanta. Casey and Cleveland, um, no Grinky, of course. Very little of the Royals. I prefer Aaron Savali. I think he's too cheap. I think he's a cash SP2 at the very least tonight. Um, could be an SP1 if you even want to anchor with it, just because of the matchup. And he's got seven pitchers, six pitches that he throws. And the Royals are bad, so sure. Uh, if you want to play some Cleveland, yeah, they're popping in value, but it's mostly because they're cheap, not because they're a high-probability offense against Zach Greinke. Um, who only gives up three runs and goes five innings every start. So uh, I'm going to probably stay off of full stacks of Cleveland, but, you know, single tin pieces and short stacks are very much in play uh, at, at better price tags than they've been recently. Seattle, Minnesota, pitching mostly, leverage stacks, I think, only. Um, not so much of Seattle. I'm probably just going to leave them completely on the shelf here tonight. I love Pablo at 10-4. I don't love 10-4, but I do love the fundamental spot against Seattle. Um, same thing with George Kirby. Don't love 8,700, but... I really like the fundamental spot against the Twins. I prefer Twins leverage pieces, uh, as I mentioned, because Kirby's a little bit more susceptible to left-handers than Pablo is to really either side of the plate. Uh, Texas-Houston, offense only here for me. No J.P. France whatsoever. I like righties from Texas. That's Semyon, Addy Garcia, Josh Young, um, you know, the, the usual suspects over here. You play a Zeke Duran, too. He's at shortstop again tonight, 3,300. Very playable piece, unfortunately, down at the bottom of the lineup. But you can also play a Jonah Heim from behind the plate. That's fine, too, from the left side. Uh, but no pitching here for me um, pretty much at all. If your Alvarez is back tonight, go ahead and play him. If he's not back, go ahead and play him. He's just too cheap. Uh, Cincinnati and Milwaukee. Andrew Abbott and Corbin Burns. This is a really interesting tournament game. I think offense could get there from both sides of these uh, of this game um, just because these teams have seen these guys so much. However, the fundamental spots for them are fantastic. Uh, Corbin Burns, I'd have to side with him, I guess, uh, just because he's 9,200, but I, I prefer the ownership delta that we're getting with Abbott here. He's only 6 8% owned. Corbin Burns, 35% owned. So um, they're both in play, but uh, yeah, don't be surprised if either one of them get picked off here tonight. Um, so I'd be careful with your heavy ownerships on them. Cubs, White Sox, Kopech, no thanks. I wouldn't be surprised if he pops a little bit here because the Cubs are kind of bad. Um, Break-even offense against right-handed pitching. He still has a lot of strikeout upside against lefties. So we've got to be careful with that. Um, Kyle Hendricks, I think he's in play here. I really like this changeup, man. And he's probably going to pop for you know, maybe 20, 22 points. Um, you know, in these types of matchups. And I think that plays. I think that could play here tonight, um, even on a full 12-game slate. So no White Sox for me. I don't want to deal with any of that. They're just terrible. Pittsburgh, San Diego, if you want to leverage against Blake Snell, yeah, go ahead. He's got a high walk rate, and he's going to be 35% owned. Uh, go ahead. He's expensive. I'm going to come in underweight on 10,000 Blake Snell. Uh, I just don't want to deal with that at very high ownership. Um, I'll come in well underweight and just pivot most of it all to, you know, to Pablo or whoever the hell else. San Diego, yeah, I want no Rich Hill whatsoever. Um, you want to leverage against Blake Snell, sure. Uh, Connor Joe, Andrew McCutcheon types, that's fine. And everybody from San Diego going after Rich Hill, I'm cool with that. St. Louis and the D-backs. Merrill Kelly, I'm okay playing at low ownership. Want to be careful with it. Don't want to get too crazy. No Steven Matz whatsoever. I'd like some Arizona. I'm going to go right back to him, even though uh, Adam Wainwright did kind of make me look like a jackass last night. Um so I've got no problem going back to them. Uh, really offense only. If you want to play some St. Louis, it's like Nolan Gorman or Lars, maybe. Uh, Nolan Arenado. That's pretty much it for me. I don't like going after Merrill Kelly generally. Oakland, San Francisco. No Oakland outside of like my typical one-off Seth Brown. Um, no Waldachuk, absolutely. Uh, short stacks, one-offs for me against San, or for San Francisco against Oakland. Uh, Alex Cobb, as much of this as I can make happen. You could play an Alex Cobb and a... Uh, where is he, Aaron Savali type of team, and get to a really expensive stack somewhere. Um, that is very much in play, like a game stack. Or you can play the Dodgers here in the next game against Chris Bassett. No no Bassett whatsoever for me. And Julio Urias, sure, in deep tournament stuff uh, on the main. I think he's a little bit expensive for me personally, but uh, pretty good late slate play, I think, there. Dodgers, absolutely. Max Muncy, Freddie Freeman, mostly. But uh, you could play any of the cheap outfielder uh 
pieces there, Outman, Peralta, or Jason Hayward at your leisure. So that's it. We're done here. Once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as we will push them all throughout the day to flesh out the standard deviations noise. So good luck to everybody here on Tuesday's 12 Gamer.